30 seconds. Hi, my name's JC McCauley. I'm Naisha McCauley, and well, you're, you're watching, watching AccessTV.org. My friends, once again, it is indeed time to get our talk on. It's Morning Talk with me, your host, Jay Sam McCauley, along with the champions of talk. Miss Cleo, I think, is on her way. I hope so. She's running a little late, I think, this morning. But uh, we have a special guest joining us today. So we're going to start and get underway. We have a special guest joining us for the first half of the program. Then, of course, Jonathan Small will be here on the second half of the program. But we're going to jump right into a conversation with a, a local community icon doing great things in the city of Harvard. We're going to talk to her about her upcoming event and uh, a little bit of history with the one and only Patricia Kelly from the Ebony Horseman. Good morning, Pat. How are you? Hi, Stan. How are you? Thanks for having me on. It's good to see you. You're looking good, as always change a little hair color all right talk to us a little bit about um you know first who who what is the ebony horsewoman who is who is patricia kelly and uh about this great event that you have the second annual of um you know the uh the black boots awards ah yeah well we let's start off with what is ebony horsewoman mm -hmm. uh, Trish Kelly over to the side a little bit. Ebony Horsewomen um, is a 40-year-old organization, nonprofit here in, in, in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. It's an equestrian youth development and therapeutic organization um, doing a lot of different things. We have, I think, the only um, urban riding establishment of our kind anywhere in America. Um, providing the kind of services that we do. We have youth programs, we have therapeutic programs, we have training programs for mental health professionals in the modality of equine assisted psychotherapy. Presently, we have about seven licensed, um, licensed therapists working with us that are certified in equine assisted psychotherapy, providing these services to youth, families, veterans, adults, you know, everyone that, that's in need of it. And uh, that kind of business has exploded since uh, the pandemic. We find that you know a lot of people, not just children and, and youth, but a lot of adults and veterans no longer trust or feel comfortable with talk therapy. So the, the animal assisted therapy and particularly equine therapy has really exploded. Uh, we also provide public writing lessons. We do cultural events last October. We had Native American powwow here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we do holiday events, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Santa Claus, giving away gifts during the holidays, a lot of different horse shows, a lot of different things here. So, um, and we're in the beautiful 693 acre Keeney Park, which is absolutely, you know, the best place to be to have these kinds of events and services and programs going on. 
it's in our community, in uh, urban community and people of color community, which makes it even better. So we've been doing this again about 40 years, and we've had generations and generations of children and youth to come through. And today we're now um, even having some of the children of the children that we used to serve back in the day. So it's, it's a beautiful thing to see. It's a lovely organization, and we just built a museum that is called the Mary Field Stagecoach Mary Museum. Um, and this kind of goes hand in hand with who we are, but also what we're trying to endeavor the Western culture back into the minds of um, the people so that it, no one thinks that blacks are Johnny come lately to the Western scene or the equestrian scene. Uh, scene. So we're doing that as well. The museum should be finished in the next 45 days. Uh, we're going to do a soft opening in October, and so there will be running regular programming in the museum as well. So that's a little bit about what we're doing, but we also have, as you mentioned earlier, um, another initiative that we started two years ago that had been in the works for about 10 years thinking about it. Um, the Black Boots Awards, which is a national recognition and honoring of black equestrians um, in every discipline of the horse industry across the United States. And our first um, award ceremony was held last year in January at the Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts, and it was absolutely fabulous. We had black equestrians coming in from all across the country, uh, Colorado, Kentucky, Chicago, Maryland, Texas, uh, California, uh, Illinois, just so many that came in to get their honors. Um, and it was a beautiful, beautiful event, starting with the VIP reception and then the actual award ceremony. It was absolutely, we had celebrities there. We had Jason Mims there uh, from one of the TV shows on OWN. Wonderful event, great turnout. It was just absolutely um, more than that we could have expected. And as an offshoot from that, we began the Black Boots magazine. That is a digital magazine that is all about black equestrians um, and the kinds of work that they're doing, the fabulous achievements that they're making across the country. Wow. Uh, last year, I remember last year's, it was, it was, it was, spectacular and uh this year is three days like last year yeah. was, was two days or one it was one day one we day. got lucky yeah. my god we yeah got lucky yeah day. yeah uh this year though it's it's a it's a three-day event right this year is three days it's on the memorial day weekend um as i said last year we got lucky because we did this in january and you know this is connecticut we could have had a blizzard during that time but it was great there was no snow on the ground it was wonderful this year is on Memorial Day weekend, so we start off with, on Friday night, um, the Denim and Diamonds Western Dance, which is, I can't wait for that because I got boots, new boots for that. <laughs> uh, and then we have the awards ceremony on Saturday evening, and we're back at the Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts um, for the awards ceremony. And then Sunday, we have... Um, a barbecue and trail ride. So we've got a lot of cowboys and cowgirls bringing their horses in for the event. So we're going to have a great barbecue and trail ride on Sunday. So this is this is very very exciting um, that we get to celebrate these wonderful equestrians um, for three days. We we get to really honor them and be with them. So we're we're looking forward to it. I have a. Uh... I have a video here I was going to play. It, it, it beat me to the punch. Hold on a second. Let me let me play this video here. Get my technology together. Technology is only as good as the person operating it. Let's see if we can get do this here. We can the choir now. I know that. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> and I'm not that good. Uh, okay, here we go. Absolutely outstanding. Let's make 
Friday night, the celebration on Saturday, and a big trail ride and barbecue on Sunday. All right, there we go. There we go. There. We go. So, um, talk a little bit about the awards and the awardees. You have uh, you've got people who come. I mean, like people from all over the country. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I mean, this is big. This is this is really really this is a huge event, and I don't I don't I don't think that people understand uh, or or truly appreciate. Uh, the gift that this is to Hartford, because this could be done, this could be done anywhere. I mean, it could be held anywhere in the world, Los Angeles or anywhere in the country, Los Los An Los Angeles it could be in, in New York, but it's uh, it's being held here in Hartford. Yeah. So let me kind of give you a little bit of a background. Mm -hmm. um, about eh, six years ago, um, I'm I'm doing some research on on some things and i come across um a question on the internet asking <laughs> if there are any black equestrians and i'm like what do you mean <laughs> are there any black equestrians what, what what i don't understand i'm confused and in looking at across the spectrum how there is a concerted effort to deny and diminish the history of black accomplishments across the board, which also includes the denial and dismissal of blacks in the horse industry. And um, there are some things that we knew from years and years and years ago, but kind of thought everybody knew, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and as I did more and more research, there were there were these questions that just kept popping up about, you know, do blacks involve themselves in this, that, and the other? And I, to tell you the truth, it, it really angered me mm, about mm. knowing that. I know it's difficult here in the Northeast to be a black cowgirl. I know it's difficult. Um, and then in terms of in the horse industry as a whole in the Northeast, and particularly Connecticut, it's ebony horsewomen in a smithering of other individuals. Mm -hmm. And that's it. But when you go past the Mason-Dixie line, when you go past D.C., uh, even into New York, there's the Federation of Black Cowboys. Mm -hmm. uh, in New Jersey, is the Crazy Faith Riders. There's, and there's just so many. And I'm like, wh why is this being covered up? Or why is it not being um, exposed that not only are we not Johnny come latelys, but we started a lot of this stuff. Right, right. And so why is it there a question as to whether or not we're um, either, you know, existing? The flip side of that is that that really got me was that knowing the numbers of black equestrians, rodeo, horse, horse trainers, uh, tradesmen, people who are making saddles, farriers, blacksmiths, uh, organizations out there, polo, racing, you name it. We we buy trucks, <laughs> we buy trailers, we buy horse feed, we buy horses, we buy a tire, we buy tack, and you gonna still ignore us? Mm -hmm. And a lot of money. I mean, <laughs> our, one of our young men uh, who graduated from the program, who actually won last year as the tradesman of the year, mm -hmm. um, with the area, a.k.a. Blacksmith, um, just bought another truck. It was sixty five thousand dollars, and that's meager, right? Um, particularly when you got to pull a trailer, you got to have a certain kind of truck, yada yada. And this is happening across the country. And you know, Ford companies like um, uh, truck companies like Ford and Ram and all, don't ignore us. We're buying your trucks. Mm -hmm. We're buying trailers. We're buying horse. So anyway, I was like, <laughs> so God said, well, what you gonna do? Right. <laughs> Right. You gonna keep complaining, or what you gonna do? And I said, "Well, you're right. I'm gonna do something. If you will not, the wider society, it, it, acknowledge us. Uh, why I keep asking you to do that? I'll do that. We will acknowledge ourselves. And so thus came about the Black Boots Awards. And and I tell you, <laughs> 
my board was like, Pat, um, we don't have no money for this stuff. I know we don't, but this is, I, we, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to. I, it's for our children. It's not, it's, it's also for our children. When, you know, in, in Connecticut, in the Northeast, I take my kids to horse shows and, um, it's, it's, it's gratifying because when we go, they were like, Oh, Ebony is in the house. Well, that's, it's gratifying, but does that mean that we are it? And y'all don't acknowledge anybody else here. You know, it's it's that our children need to know who we are, what we've done, what we are continuing to do, and you will not ignore us. <laughs> you just will not. And uh, so when God said to me, "Well, what you gonna do? You gonna keep complaining?" I said, "No, I'm gonna do it." And I just had to convince my board that um, this was certainly something that we could do. And I was amazed at the reception that we got when we put this out. We started with a nomination period. We had over 120 nominations coming in from every state in the union, every state. And black equestrians in every discipline of the horse industry. And I thought, okay, all right. So that's what I needed. So then we began to branch out to some of these well-known entities that supply um, horse industry uh, products, you know, like a tire and trucks and trailers and feed and stuff like that. And we, w we got a great, you know, reception by them to do sponsorships. And so we were, we were on our way. And then I ran into the fabulous Miss Danny Fireson who had come back to Hartford, it's this being her home, but she had been in Georgia for many years, and um, multi-talented young lady. And I partnered with her, and, and she became the executive producer of the Black Boots Awards. And we were able to pull this off. And I tell you, it was the most beautiful thing that I think that we have ever accomplished um, in terms of a wider community and bringing us all together we had people rodeo people english riding people western reigning polo vaulting um horse farms other individuals across the country who owned horse farms and um just every entity it was absolutely amazing i thank god it was gorgeous and so it it, it is now going to continue it's a struggle it's a struggle being that in a Yankee Eastern state, there's not much to be said about the black cowboy culture. Um, and that partly is because of our negligence. Mm. You know, we, most of our people, when we go back far enough, enough, most of our people came from the South. And everybody back then had, um, a horse or a mule. Mm -hmm. And I remember when Ebony Horsewomen first got started and we trying to get, you know, women involved because we started off as a women's organization. Women were like, you know, we had horses in the South and New South and I don't want to be bothered with them anymore. Well, I get that because it was a different kind of scene then. It was agricultural and it was work and all of that, but this was mm -hmm. now recreational. So the history, the lineage is there. Um, but as we go forward into this this no new technology stage, a lot of the culture of black people have been lost, and the Black Boots Award just kind of brings it back again. You know, and as I did an interview with uh, your beautiful wife Naisha last year, I, I mentioned that you know, in in racing, which is the um, crown jewel, if you will, will of the horse industry. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm the first 13 winning jockeys of the Kentucky Derby were black men and they ruled racing. They ruled racing. Uh, but of course, uh, racism took mm -hmm, over. Mm -hmm. they decided they would uh, license jockeys and they would not license black men. And some of those black guys went to Russia and became billionaires, millionaires and billionaires. So, you know, we, we, we were in it from the beginning and the whole term cowboy 
came about from one in three cowboys in the West were black men, and they herd cattle, but they were not called cattle men, cattle hands, cattle popes. They were called boys. Mm, mm, mm. Our boys. So mm-hmm. that whole term came about as it relates to black men who herd cattle. Mm. But of course, Hollywood comes over, comes in, takes this, makes it an icon, Don Wayne, Audie Murphy, all these other white cowboy types and throws black men out all together that they weren't even around then and make this this icon and no mention of the black cowboy at all. Bill Pickett, um, rodeo master who who created bulldogging, um, had to go and get his own rodeo because they wouldn't let him compete in the white rodeos. So you name it, we've been there, done that, y'all. <laughs> and it's time for y'all to stop ignoring us, but I'm not looking for a ta- uh, seat at your table. I will create our own table and we'll sit there. So thus, again, the Black Boots Awards. It was very, very nice last year. I'm looking forward to this year because there's three days. There's the uh, there's the dance. There's the award ceremony, which is going to be over at the uh, learning court or at the uh, theater. And right. then, of course, there's the... Uh, there's the barbecue, yeah, the trail and, ride, and the trail ride. That's going to be interesting. Talk a little bit about the barbecue and the trail ride. Well, everybody loves to eat barbecue, <laughs> you know, and you put a good trail ride with it, it um, you can't beat it. But uh, again, understanding a couple of things. One, we've got some of these cowboys and cowgirls bringing their horses in, and they will be riding their own horses in the trail ride. But for, for some of the community folks who want to be a part of this and don't want to get on a horse, and I get that, but we have a hay wagon that we're going to take um, people out on rides through the park, mm-hmm. beautiful teeny park, um, and show them you know what the park has to offer and then come back for the barbecue and dancing and just communing with each other and talking with some of the awardees that stay over for the, tra- the, the barbecue and trail ride. So we're, that's going to be a good time. You know, you take off the heels, take off the gown, put your jeans on, and um, eat some really, really great food. we got George Milner that's cooking. We've got Chef Jay that's helping out with that as well. And so it's going to be a good food, good time, um, relaxing rides through the park, and just a really, really beautiful day. The uh, dance now that's a was that like black tie get gown that that's gala, well, or, or we, is that black it, boots? We, well, we call it the denim uh-huh. and diamond. Dem, denim, and, denim, denim no and diamonds. diamonds. Okay. Denim and diamonds. Yes. So you know, we don't we're not looking for you to put your gowns on. We're looking for you to put your best western boots on. Get your western duds on. Get dutied up and come in and dance. We have um, people coming in. That's going to teach us how to do two step okay. and some line dancing. Okay. And then we're going to have we'll have um, beverages and food there as well. Um, and so it's going to be really, really uh, special because we'll get to use our museum um, pre the soft opening for mm-hmm. that evening. And so we're excited about that. And it's just, I think, a good old Western dance. I think we haven't given a Western dance in, God, 20 years. I think we gave one. 20 some odd years ago but this time this western dance is going to be really special because we'll have some of the awardees there mm. come in early. Mm. and we're looking for uh reginald dorsey to come in reginald dorsey is an actor in um hollywood and he's done a lot of western movies he's done movies with glenn thurman um he's he's an activist uh, uh and a director so he will be with us for the dance as well. So I'm really excited about it because I, I get a new pair of jeans and get some new boots and duty myself up and, and get out there and try to do a little bit I can do in terms of dancing. But I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to give it a try. If people want to go, how do they get in touch with you? How do they, you know, how do they get tickets? So um, it's on Eventbrite and um, it's on our website as well. So if they go to ebonyhorsewomen.org, um, the Black Boots Awards is going to pop up on the screen, and then they just follow the prompts to where you get the um, 
the the stuff, you know, the the tickets from Eventbrite and all the rest. All right. All that's on the website. And everything is right here. You can click yep. on the days you want to go and what you want to do. And yep. um, everything is right there. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, for more information, is there anybody that they can call? Well, they can call the office at any time. Mm -hmm. um, we have a wonderful um, assistant, uh, admin assistant, um, and she can help you out. Um, but anybody that answers the phone can help you. Uh, we'll, we have um, flyers we can send out. If you leave us your email address, we can send that out to you. Um, so there's several different ways you can get information about it and attend. And we're looking for Harper to turn out. Come on, Harper. Come on, black folk. Come out here and see these cowboys and, and remember your roots. All right. All right. So Patricia Kelly's been our guest this morning. Uh, Jonathan Small will be up next. And uh, we'll send out a search a search party for Miss Cleo. I don't know where, where she is. I hope she's okay. Yeah, girl, you keep her alone. Cleo got, got something to do. Something really important kind of stuff. Something, right something came up, or I'm sure yeah. she would be here. I was going to surprise her with you being the guest, but she she's um, she she she's I'm sure um, doing something that's uh, important. It's always good to see you, Pat. I'm look forward to uh, I'm looking forward to the awards. And uh, I'll be there. Uh, on, I want to. I want to capture some of this happening on Friday night, especially with the line dancing and people learning how to do new dances. And yeah. uh, of course, Saturday with the awards and the awardees with the. Uh, at the yeah, put at your the gowns on and your tux on that one. Yes, yes. Um, dress to the nines. Yes, sir. All right. God bless you. Continue the great work. Thank you, Stan. Anytime. All right, my good friend, Patricia Kelly. We'll take a short break, listen to a little bit of Jay Hogart, uh, the phenomenal, the one and only. Stick and stay, don't go anywhere. We will be right back. It is Morning Talk.
J. Hogart. All right. I want to play another Jay Hogart song. I love Jay's music. You all don't really get a chance to hear the whole album. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's play. Let's do this one here. Make sure this is queued up right. Oh yeah. I know that this is our opening theme. So look, I'm gonna play this all the way to the end uninterrupted. Hi. My name's JC McCauley. I'm Naisha McCauley, and, and you're, you're watching, watching AccessTV.org.
one more and then we will be back with Jonathan Small stick and stay
All right, Jonathan Small is here in the house. Uh, 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 uh. How you doing there, Jonathan? He's under pressure. <laughs> it is 10. Well, it's two minutes to 10. You got two minutes. Take your time, brother. Take your time. Take your take your time. Yeah, Miss Cleo's not here this morning, so I, I was trying to fill in until you got here. But John, he's looking through he's looking through his stuff for his phones. He doesn't want the phone to ring while we're on the air. All right, take your time. Take your time, Jonathan. We're live. Don't worry about it, brother. There it is in your pocket. Okay. There we go. There we go. Let's get let's get Jonathan all set up. Mic is set. There we go. <clears throat> Camera four. I'm trying to get a shot of you again. Mm -hmm. How you doing? There you go. I'm doing fine. It's good to see <laughs> see how you look on camera. <laughs> Get everything. The madness of it all. Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah, it's good to be back here, Stan. It's I'm good to sure. have you back. Yeah, exactly. How was your weekend? The weekend was nice. I mean, I got a chance to watch a little NCAA college basketball, mm -hmm. and um, looks like UConn is on a mission. That's all I can say. The way things are headed, on a mission to win. To win, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've I've never seen a team blow out this many teams by the margin of victory. They went on a thirty old start, or I guess what they call a thirty old span in the second half, mm -hmm. and that's blew that game wide away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, anything can happen. You know, you play your A game, I think UConn is the team to beat. If they play their best, if they play their A game, I can't see anybody beating them unless they have an off night and um, they look like they're just focused and ready to go all the way. And um, also the Cinderella team, I think, is North Carolina State. You know, they... They seem to be on a mission in another way, too. They seem to be doing something similar to what they did in 1983. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not the best. They're not better than UConn, but, you know, they could beat anybody if they play their best game and other teams like UConn have their off game. Mm -hmm. So keep an eye on the uh, Final Four. <laughs> All right, so... um. You are obviously a uh, basketball fan. Well, I'm a college basketball fan. Right. I like the NBA. I could take it or leave it. But college basketball, you don't see the difference, uh, the intensity. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you well, pay attention. I don't watch basketball. So yeah. I, I just don't know. But I've heard people say that college ball is just faster. It's, it is. It's, it's more. It's, 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 it's a more um, uh, in the cut game as opposed to like uh, you know, I guess like straight ahead jazz versus uh, smooth jazz well they play defense in college basketball I mean NBA you know and I don't want to be critical but I got to be honest you know they the, the talent level towards them being athletes is far superior than it were 30 or 40 years ago they can jump higher they can more faster they can dribble the ball way more creative but they don't have that team, you know, You like you said, you didn't really follow NBA in the Bird and Magic era. Mm. That mm. era was real competitive, defense, rebounding. And this is more like, you know, you play defense when it gets close to the playoffs and it's like you're just trying to score. I'm just not that excited. I mean, LeBron James obviously is still a superstar and he definitely met, had made his mark. But college basketball, you see the intensity, you see the defense mm -hmm. playing. They it's like they play more with heart. Now I guess you know they're college; they're not getting paid like you get paid in the NBA. I don't know if that has if that has anything to do with it. 
But the NBA, and plus, if we look at the pro, our professional basketball, they allow traveling. You know, you could take three. I see players now taking three or four steps to the basket. <laughs> it's like, like you know, they want you to walk the ball walk, down yeah, the court. Walk the ball, <laughs> and the referee don't can't the referee can't see this. It used to be a time you have to take two steps to the basket. Mm-hmm. I see three and four. <laughs> so I, I'm just not into the NBA to be honest. You know, okay. I'm a college basketball. I love college basketball, mm-hmm. but um, you know, I know I'm, I'm pretty sure you are UConn. You you probably be rooting for UConn. Absolutely. How can you live in Connecticut <laughs> and not root for both? I mean, uh, even if I wasn't, I am. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> you know. So now, I mean, UConn, of course, is. Uh, and the men and the women's actually there. Yeah, but... Right, men and women, mm-hmm. all the way to the end. We're gonna have a double, a double, um, double victory. It'll be the third time. Well, keep an eye now. South Carolina still looks like they might be the, I guess you could say the best team on paper, but that doesn't mean you're gonna win. You know, South Carolina over the past three to four years with Don Staley, she's really turned that program around, mm-hmm. and. But they don't. But see, South Carolina, they don't always win it either. They ha- they may have the best record, but they sometimes don't. Now we talking you. Uh, we talking uh, men or women? The women. All right. So the women. They they have a better record than UConn women. I believe so. I think the woman is number one. I don't not the woman UConn is not ranked number one. The men is ranked number one. How many? But, so how are they? When you say rank, is ranked directly? Related to the number of games you've won? Uh, yes. Okay. And then the teams that you play, too. Okay. The competition. So mm-hmm. you could have a better record, and if the other team played stronger competition, sometimes they'll put the team with more losses, believe it or not, as the number one or, or higher rank than the team that won more games. So they look at who you play, too. Okay, so playing – does not winning doesn't necessarily mean you're better than some of the other teams because you could have played against a team that really wasn't that good. Exactly. So they look at that. Now South Carolina just is ranked number one overall. UConn for the women and the UConn men is ranked number one overall for the men. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, give um, UConn credit, man. I mean, they really have put college basketball for Connecticut on the map. You know. Five over the past, particularly the women over the past twenty years, but the men has been good too, though. I mean, they've won some NCAA championships too, so mm-hmm. really, really um interesting. And um, y'all press the press conference, the Greater Hartford African American Alliance put together was excellent, as I said. You enjoyed the press and, conference, uh, huh? yeah. And like I said, I gotta, I know y'all planning uh, another meeting in a couple of weeks yeah another special meeting uh this is a follow-up to the first special meeting but i think the press conference was really you know you're having people speak directly like bridget prince and cynthia jennings Mm -hmm. and then yourself too Mm -hmm. and then you're taking questions from the media and they asked them i thought they the media asked some real interesting questions Mm -hmm. one question was you know what the amount of jobs hirings that you see companies are looking for people why is there such a problem of people being employed and then Cynthia was talking about the felony record for for some uh Mm -hmm. yeah uh, absolutely but if you consider a lot of the people in in urban areas uh particularly if those areas are impacted by poverty they you know you have high lit high illiteracy rates Mm. uh you don't have a long job employment history yeah so and 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 the the concentration of those individuals put them in a place where there is obviously high poverty and so they become difficult to employ when you consider all the other people that are vying for jobs well, I look at it, you know, the I think the biggest reasons why people are not going to get certain jobs or occupations, careers, businesses, is you have to meet, like you mentioned, the criteria. It has to be a position available, too. Mm-hmm. You know, you can meet the criteria, and then there's no position available. Right, so, and, and, and also, 
the jobs aren't in the communities where the people live. So they have to get to the job, which means right. transportation. Yeah. Um, and uh, if the jobs are in areas that traditionally don't hire people who, um, you know, with uh, prejudice being what it is, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of reasons why people. Well, well, I mean, the private. Employ- hire yeah, but a private business can hire whoever they, they that's, want. That's what I'm it, saying. As long as they don't discriminate, you know, as race. Right, 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 right. That. So, in a, you you know, the the right to work state can let you go for any reason. They're not going to mm-hmm. say it's because I don't like the way you cut your hair. Right. They'll say for some other reason. So he gives there's the employer has huge room for which to uh, terminate or let you go. But you know, and I, and I don't want to say this on any point in any finger. And I think you can only do what you can do. But I think where we're missing the boat at, and I keep bringing it up, is investing your money in group economics. Investing your money means, and I asked you a couple of months ago about what would it cost to build. Um, I said media company, you said more like a media operation. So a half a million dollars really wouldn't be a company from what you were stating. It well, would like be- Byron Allen's operation. <laughs> yeah, well, Byron Allen is trying to buy what? I think a profession. I thought he was trying to buy a network one time. And- well, he's got quite he's got quite an operation, but this, of course, is one of your pet peeve subjects. So you we, we talk about this a lot. But, um, you know, all it takes is money. Yeah, well, it's easy to figure out because if you say all it takes is money, and if it's a half a million dollars, and if I don't have a half a million dollars, I got $25,000, I I need to find other people with the same interest that I have to, to what they call it, um... There's a word when you when you put when you group a group of people together with their money, um, it'll come to me. Mm-hmm. Um, a, um, consortium. You get a group of people together, put the money that equals a half a million dollars. Now, this is the part that I don't understand. You know, is the company or the operation going to generate profit on a yearly basis? Do you get your rate of return what you invested, just like that? You know, I, that part I don't know exactly. I think you understand it very well. Just the, the the what you posed says you have a understand. How do you make it pay? Where's the return on your pro well, on your in on your investment? And you're talking a half a million dollars. How much did the golf channel spend? Yeah, we know that had to be in the millions. I'm pretty sure. Absolutely. So, and they didn't, you know, the, remember the little operation they had down here? I don't know. It was the golf channel? Oh, it was back the nine. Channel, back nine. Yeah. yeah. With the uh, golf lifestyle television, it, it it didn't make it. Spent millions of dollars. Broadcasting survives on advertising dollars, and you have to have large audience in order to generate the kind of revenue you get from advertising dollars. Mm. And you don't have the luxury of taking twenty years to build your audience. If right. that audience doesn't come like right now mm-hmm. with you, you're done. And it doesn't matter how much you put in. What's the likelihood of you getting it back? And with changing in broadcasting and how uh, people acquire their information uh, going mostly online, <clears throat> it's very, very difficult. <clears throat> so if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to do this so that you can make money, right? and there's nothing wrong with that, if you're trying to do this so that you can make money, you're you're you gonna need a lot of it in order to recapture your funds, your investment. Well, but keep in mind, I use media as an example. I think business, any business that can generate revenue that it costs and that there's a need for. So it could be media, it could be a restaurant, it could be something else. If well, it, if you can invest your money and get a rate of return. I like that scenario. I like to be able to say I can invest twenty five thousand. I'll get back my twenty five and another twenty five thousand at least, uh, at the very minimum, and then have it coming in every single year. Well, it doesn't really, as you mentioned, you know, you, the, these are examples. So it doesn't really matter what the enterprise is. Mm-hmm. If you cannot make a profit, your enterprise is done. Right. 
it's it's just that simple. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a beauty salon, a barber shop, a a, a, a bodega, doesn't matter what it is. A lawn cutting service, a package delivery service. If you don't have income coming in, you're going to be done. The United States Postal Service just switched its main air freight carrier from uh, uh, FedEx mm. to UPS. Mm. FedEx has had that contract or that arrangement with them, I think, for 20, 21 years. It was their major client. So their their major client is gone. Yeah. That's going to impact Federal Express. Where are they going to get that kind of client again? They're not. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how, how that shakes out for them. I don't know what that means for them. Even places like Amazon and some of these bigger companies that did a lot of hiring during the pandemic are letting folks go. So, yeah, it would be nice to do that, but that's on paper and in theory. If you could get 100 people, black folk, to all put $1,000 in the pot, 5000 in the pot, you'd have a lot of money and you could do something with it. But get me the thousand people. Yeah. See, so when the 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 talking about it and and the delivery are two different things. But if you present something that you can almost say, and I know a guarantee is very hard to say in business, but if you have a high rate of success in something, it's a lot easier to convince people to say this is a good investment. People talk about investing money in the stock market. That's risky. It's only risky if you don't know what you're doing. Okay. Let me rephrase that. There's a level of risk, yes, but there's more risk if you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The more you understand what you're investing in, the more likely you are to succeed. And there are some people who are very good at investing in companies, knowing what the company's track record is, who's running the company, what Mm -hmm. their what their what what is their product, what is their record, you know, over the years in terms of returns. Well, real estate, people look at that as a good model, you know, buying property and fix it. Up, the right you know, properties. Fix up the right properties. In the right neighborhoods. Mm. If you buy a property where there is no, where in a distressed community, unless that distressed community is slated to be flipped over mm. or gentrified, how do you expect to get your money back? The reason the, the property you bought is in distress was because of people that owned it before you couldn't keep it up. Yeah. It's like buying a restaurant that never that, that continually fails. Well, or let me rephrase that. You're going to open up a restaurant on a on a block or a corner or in a location that every restaurant before it failed. Mm-hmm. But your brilliant plan is going to make it succeed. Yeah. Well, that's that's troubling. Maybe hopefully optimistic because there's a reason why it doesn't work there. All right. And you can open it somewhere else. So, I mean, businesses succeed, businesses fail. But the reason to go into business is to make money. Yeah. Well, if you are an investor, I don't know if that's a business. I mean, you just want to invest your money and you want to get a rate in return. Mm -hmm. So, there's different levels of investments. I mean, IRAs and other things. But most of these things takes time. It's not like, okay, you can take, you know, 25,000 and saying, I want to get back my 25 and another 25 the same year. It usually takes a, like a process before, if you're just going to invest your money in a normal traditional, they have different terminologies that they use for investments, you know, IRAs and other investment accounts. Um, now I was always told the higher the right. amount, the higher the risk. The high, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> the, the 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 more money, but the higher return too. So the greater <laughs> the greater the risk. Greater risk. The greater the reward. The greater the reward. Well, you got to be willing uh, to take that risk and see if it doesn't work out. I've lost a big sum of money. Right. So you that means you have the, the capacity to absorb a huge loss. So you have a lot of disposable income. Right. But, you know, what we're talking about when Cynthia Jennings and yourself and Bridget Prince is talking about or the media is asking you about high unemployment, you know, this is probably a different scenario how you got to fix this problem. You know, the type of jobs that's most likely going to hire 
people what issues if they're not properly unemployed i mean if they're not properly educated or trained i mean you could get a job minimum wage that requires very little training just a willingness to work but is this what you really want to do is this really going to pay off to what you're looking for doubtful well i mean yeah to me you're mixing apples and oranges here so that the the desire of the individual who's unemployed is different from let us fix the whole community. Right, right. So, you know, you may want to fix the whole community. That doesn't mean everyone in the community is going to buy into your fix. Right. But people, most people would buy into if they can get something. Well, I don't want to say something for nothing, but if you could take $100 and get $500, but that's not usually how the process works no you know? it, sounds, it sounds scammy scammy yeah you know give me a hundred i'll return 500 fold <laughs> i mean folk are looking at it well now nah, i don't know about that uh, and that works in your mind you're the one pitching the idea yeah well if it works so well take your one dollar turn it into five five into 25 25 into 125 i mean if, if the theory works for them apply it to oneself and make your own money yeah but see, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way because I can't guarantee how I'm going to get <laughs> Right, 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 right. You can't guarantee your own return, but you can make a return guarantee for everyone else. Yeah. I think when you look at things that have been successful, you could do the analysis and, you know, deconstruct how they got there uh-huh. so that you have an understanding. To me, you now have an understanding of how they got there. That doesn't mean you could take that recipe and apply it to you or some other situation and you get to the same place. Mm-hmm. Because it's not an exact science. There are a lot of factors that contributed to the success that you don't have access to. Right. That's true. And so while while someone else did it does not mean that you can do it. In fact, they say, you know, past performance is not a guarantee of future success. No, but you just said the key word. You just don't have access to it because somebody has told me a long time ago, if I'm going to figure out or help you make a profit or make money or have something that's going to benefit you 99% of the time, the person going to want to know what can they get out of it? Mm -hmm. You know, no strings attached. That's kind of hard to sell. Somebody knows how they can take a person's situation and get them to where they're looking to be at. And then you want this person to assist you, but what can you offer the person for what they're willing to do? Mm -hmm. Now, you tell them, because I've had these conversations with people, okay, you could find me a six-figure income. I can give you a cut out of the money. No, they want the money up front. See, this is where business can become cutthroat. You know, I'm telling you, okay, if you help me get $150,000, just using this as an um, example, $80,000, $90,000, I don't got $10,000 to give you up front. But get me the job, and then we'll work out a negotiation how I just give you the $10,000. No, he doesn't want to do it that way. Well, why should he? Why should I give you <laughs> your salary all at once up front? Yeah. Well, not well, salary. So help you get a job that can pay you or help you get into business that can pay you. He's not, you, you're not asking him. I guess you, I guess you could ask. Yeah, I guess you could say you're asking the person to help. So you. someone's going to give you, this sounds like someone's going to give you an opportunity right. to make 90 grand. Right. In order to get to that 90 grand, you got to give them 10 grand. And they want it up front. Up front. And in, and on the back end, you're going to wind up with a $90,000 job. Right. And then, but you got to be sure you're going to get the $90,000 job too. Somebody tells you something. That sounds scammy. It sounds, to it, me. Yeah, it, well, scammy, and it could be risky too. Because what if this person can't get you the job? Well, I mean, what? If, first of all, <laughs> what kind of job are we talking about? Are they gonna take you know like ten percent of the salary? Yeah. That you're gonna get as a as a find as a finder's fee. I guess you could say it's a finder's fee. I mean, there there are headhunters, but the headhunter is looking for the, the the people the headhunter are approaching are folks that absolutely positively can command the salary associated with the job and can get the job. Mm. So you know, it's a matter of sifting through all of the qualified people. Yeah. So um, you well, know. well, like in the NFL, you get a sports agent. 
the agent gets a percentage of the contract. That's a good that's a good example, but there's no guarantee that the agent's going to get you the particular position. Mm -hmm. He well, may negotiate the position that's offered to you, but there's no guarantee if you get a sports agent, they're going to place you on the Dallas Cowboys as the next quarterback. Yeah. Well, you're really just trying to get your contract. You're trying to get the best deal that you're looking for. You want to get a guaranteed five-year, $25 million deal done. You're you're playing for a professional football you team. You need someone who knows what they're doing. You need a, a, a good agent. A good agent, that's what I'm saying. But, but that, that, that's a whole different scenario. Well, I'm just saying we got to – I think you got to be a little bit more creative. I think just trying to think that one day we're going to have these problems go away. You can you can say poverty and crime till you blew it in the face. All right, we understand we got poverty and crime, okay? Mm -hmm. The proven mechanisms that reduce or prevent poverty and crime is the harder part to implement. And you're saying people – There's gotta, no political will to implement it. So when you hear the violence task force operation being established in Hartford, that's not a political will to reduce. I mean, that question was asked yesterday at the press conference too. I mean, you gave your answer. Uh, it's dog not, and pony. Yeah, that, that's what that's what you said. Dog and pony. Dog and prove me wrong. Make it work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Until it works, it's dog and pony. As far as I'm concerned, this is yeah. not the first time this something like this come along. If you really wanted to deal with the problems that are in Hartford. Mm -hmm. or other areas that are impacted by the same things that are impacting Hartford. Mm -hmm. You have to deal with poverty. Yeah. There is a way to, to eliminate poverty if that's what you want to do. There's no effort to eliminate poverty. But but Hartford. now but but ask yourself, someone because you was up in UND Plaza yesterday and maybe it was a little early in the morning, so you didn't really see the able bodied people really not doing something. the able body as as defined by who well as the individual as you looking at people you feel they're able bodied that doesn't mean that they are they can walk and talk doesn't mean that they're capable of holding a job well that's employable that's that's that that's different able body is mean you may have a willingness and a physical traits to do something but you're right. That doesn't mean you're employable. Right, because a lot of people, and Hartford has, to quote former mayor Pedro Sagada, the biggest problem, Stan, that Hartford has is individuals' mindset in terms of their, um, you know, mental state. Hartford, yeah. Hartford has, has some serious issues. And it's not, it's not a, a slight on Hartford. People with issues have to be somewhere. Yeah. And if they are all in the same place, how do you make these people employable? Right. Folk that don't work well under stress, but the jobs that are available are high stress. Right. Uh, people who can't read. Right. But the job that they need requires them to be able to read. Uh, people who need to be able to come to work on time but have no work history and no understanding that you need to call in if you're not going to make it to work. <laughs> uh, you know, well, I didn't show up as an excuse for why you didn't come in yesterday. Yeah. Well, oh, I, 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 I wasn't feeling well. <laughs> well, why didn't you call? Well, why should I call you? If I don't come, you know I ain't coming in. Yeah, I wasn't there. I should tell you I'm not coming. I mean, there's a, so there's a whole set of experiences and things that you learn over the course of time. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have exposure to those things, it makes the individual very hard to employ. Right. And, and, I and that's what we have. And so when people say, well, all these jobs are available, how come folks don't just run out and go and get them? Because... They can't just run out, go and get them. It's not like they don't want to work. Mm -hmm. But the question is, you know, are you trying to, to make it, are you trying to help them get that job? Now, there are entities in the city that do do, things, to do, do those kinds of things. Harvard Community Care, Blue Hill Civic Association. There are people who have job mentoring and job coaching programs to help, under, to help people uh, gain the skills or acquire the skills necessary 
to to um, to be employable. Yeah, but there's not enough of them. Right. There's just far more people who need the help than there are people to give them the help. But if you really want to change the dynamic, do what's necessary to eliminate poverty in that area. Well, and I that th can be done, but folks have chosen not to do it. Yeah, well, you just said the key word, you know, it's not enough for them. And this is almost like saying housing, you know, and I, I didn't think I would be saying this this quickly, but you're going to run into course a time where the average two-bedroom apartment, any, any part of the city or greater Hartford area, is going to be averaging about 2000 uh, For a two-bedroom, we're getting very close to the average rental uh, income or the average rental amount of being 2000 a month for a decent two-bedroom apartment. I know somebody now living in the West End off of Evergreen Avenue paying 1600 for a two-bedroom apartment, and it's been going up over the past three to four years. Every month, there's a rent increase in this particular building. So if you have a rent increase anywhere, see, it depends on who you are. That's devastating news mm. or it's fabulous news. <laughs> so if over a three-year period rents go up so much that the landlord is doing him or herself a disservice by continuing the $1,000 rent because right. they could get $2,000 yeah. if they just get rid of that renter, mm. right? That means that the value of of what you have is increasing because there's a demand for it. So if you're telling people, like Har I saw a thing on um, uh, 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 a, a marketing piece that talked about Hartford rents were far less, I'm paraphrasing, than the rents in Boston. It is, it is. I got family up there and friends up there. So the stressed individual in Boston is gonna start looking where? At Hartford. At Hartford. Well, the two thousand dollar month rent in Hartford is is a, it's a steal. A steal. So I moved to Hartford. Right. There's these neighborhoods that are really nice. The housing stock is really nice. There's a lot of fix them up our houses. I can move to Hartford and do very well. Mm -hmm. That means the people that are there have to go somewhere else because they have the ability to pay the two thousand well, they can pay it the folk that are there are under stress because right. they can't afford to pay it so we're being priced the people that are currently in hartford that can't afford this are being priced out of the city yeah so they, they'll, they'll be able to go somewhere else they just won't be able to stay in Hartford. well i'm, I'm questioning where they're going to even be able to go because the rent market is going up all across the board you go to west hartford it's going to be high you go to windsor it's going to be high. It's going to be high. You may have to move out of state. Out of state. There are places yeah. that you can live that, 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 and, and, and prices that you can afford. They're just not here. Yeah. It's like uh, you, you can't move to midtown Manhattan. Uh, yeah. You, you can move to West Virginia, I'm pretty sure. Uh, there you go. Get you a <laughs> you double know, Y. A double There's a place y. for you to stay. It's yeah. just not going to be here. Yeah. I, but again, I don't know if that's moving upward, forward. That might be moving what backwards or taking one step back to take two steps forward. If people truly want to maintain their presence here yeah. and are not flush with money, the only thing that they are flush with is political power. Right. So they need to exercise it or they will be on the outside looking in. There are people who wake up in the morning and look for ways to make Hartford a more prosperous city and ways to attract people that don't live here to move here and bring their money with them. And what you would like to see is help the people that's already here as human development where they can be able to earn, you know, the $2,000 what it costs because you probably can't stop it, the trend right now if the demand is going to be high. As far as I'm concerned, it's a wrap. So, right. Hartford is going to be a very successful city and the people who can't afford to stay here will be somewhere else. Yeah. And the key, you said it might be out of state too, because the state is getting, the state is expensive. All right. Cause the, the people board. that are, the people who are engineering the change could care less where you live. Mm -hmm. If you can't afford to live here, get out. They don't care where you go. Well, there, well, there was a report that came out last week. Uh, that they found 2%, which might sound like a small percentage, but it's still a big, when you total the amount of people that 
Harford has 2% of their students that's homeless. And the mayor and other staff, people were talking about ways now to figure out how you could divert students who are finding themselves homeless into some type of housing. Because, you know, when the family structure is falling apart, and I knew at some point this was, things like this were going to catch up with you or catch up with the um, generation of, of our people. So now it's caught up to the students that they find themselves over a generation period of times chronically homeless. Um, so the student is homeless? What about their parents? You know, you know, to be honest, that wasn't even mentioned in the whole statement. <laughs> well, like, the student, are the students living by themselves? Well, they must be living either on the streets or some shelter. That that, But that is a good question, Stan. So Where's the homeless the student is living in a shelter, but they're going to school every day. Well, they may not be going every day, but, they, but they're enrolled in the school system. Because, that again, after a while, that's going to catch up with you, too. You're not going to be able to function. Right. I would so. say the whole family is probably homeless. Yeah. But, they, but, you know, a homeless student sells better. Because you have to have a parent or guardian when you right. Who they stand with? Yeah, who they stand with? Yeah. So the whole family is homeless. Right. So you, I mean, if you drill down beyond the BS, <laughs> yeah, to the stuff that people talk and say, yeah, it's just crap. So you don't buy it? I absolutely don't buy it. And I challenge anyone to tell me where I'm wrong. And I'll give you all the airtime you want. Come on and show me. Come show me where I'm wrong. Well, if the student, if they show you this student who has no fixed address, they're not wrong about the homelessness. It, it, no, no, but I, I'm i challenging the validity of a group of students that have no address, that are attending school regularly, doing well in school, and the only thing that's hindering them is the fact that they don't have a place to live. Mm. That is a that is a, a nonsensical data point to me. Yeah. Where are their parents? Right. And how is it that the parents who have kids in school that don't want to go to school and skip in school and they have a problem keeping them in school, yet the student that doesn't have any place to live is going to school every day? Yeah. And the only thing holding them back is the fact they don't have a place. They're just crap. Well, I don't know if they're going to school again because you know Harford has a high absentee rate. Student so means going to school, not people who could be students, not young people, 14 to 18, student. Student means one who attends school. So hold on now. If you are a student in a school and you miss 50 days, wouldn't you still be classified as a student? You you know you if that with that level of of, of absenteeism I I you know I, if they're you know they're missing they're missing they're missing school for some reason yeah. there has to be a big reason a critical reason it could be that there's a disruption in the family uh, so when the student has to take care of the, the parent I mean if you really want to find out what's wrong and help people you can well I, when I was going to school I saw students missing fifty to a hundred days and they just didn't want to show up to school the students didn't uh, yeah. Notice. They so did. they were well, they playing hooky. They they they, hooky, they, yeah. they 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 had they had parents at home somewhere too, right? But they did. Most right. of them. I don't think they had. I mean, it might have been single parent, but they had some parents. Some and, some parents. Well, that's that's what we're saying. If you have students with parents, yeah, and they're skipping school, and their parents are having a hard time keeping them in school, in a in a culture and a society where students grouping up together, they don't want to go to school. Mm-hmm. It seems to me likely that a part of that group might be kids who don't have anywhere to be. Yeah. But you're trying to tell me that the homeless students need help so that they can go to school. I mean, it's a it's a it's an abstract data point to move some agenda forward, but it's not an agenda that's truly interested in educating the kid. It's a data point that's designed to get money from somewhere for some program mm -hmm. that they can get funding for. But if you're really interested in educating children, there are proven ways to do it. It's done all over the world. Well, the segments, first of all, said that, well, they did admit that the homelessness problem of 2% of the students has affected the, the academic standards and their educational standards so i would say homeless the homeless family the students who are whose family is homeless yeah 
grades are being affected. So you like to use the word family. You don't like the, that word homeless student. Right. It's used on purpose. <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing is said by accident at that level. Right. Everything that is uttered has a purpose and a reason for why those words are being used and chosen to articulate some narrative. And you don't think it's for the benefit of trying to fix the problem? Absolutely not. It's for the benefit of trying to find uh, find uh, pots of money or money that's already been identified. They just now need the justification to tap into it. Mm -hmm. And that's what's basically wrong with a lot of things going on. It's an effort to monetize or capture monies that can be used for something. And ultimately, once those monies are captured, they never go to what it was that you supposedly wanted the money for. There was monies were redirected somewhere and used for some other nefarious thing. Mm. Now, who does this fall on as the response? I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to get into the parents alone, but if a, if it's true what they're saying, a student has been classified as homeless. He has no fixed address. Does that fall now on the Board of Education? What what role now does they have to play? I mean, these are the things that you still got to realize. Who's responsible to the, uh, I, to the I, next I, phase? I honestly can't answer that question. Yeah. There's a whole lot of people responsible. There's a whole lot of people responsible. I wouldn't put that on the Board of Education. Yeah. There's too much put on the Board of Ed and schools. Uh -huh. You know, they're like the, the catch basin for everything wrong. Mm -hmm. But then nobody wants to give them the, the, the means and the tools necessary to fix stuff. But I mean, legally, the Board of Education is responsible for providing educational uh, schooling for the student. I would say yes. But they're not responsible for the student having a fixed address. I would say yes again. Now, they can intercede, intervene, mm -hmm. um, in, you know, some intercession um, because they care about kids. Mm -hmm. But that, you know... But you gotta ask. It, it, this is a societal problem, a whole community problem, a neighborhood yeah. problem. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, there need to be safety nets that are really designed to help. And I mean, help, help, not the illusion of help. Well, well, Stan, you had a guest on Morning Talk Live um, with Jay Stan McCauley Talk Show this morning. You might want to consider looking into this topic. It might be someone who knows about this issue could be a good guess well i think we've had guests over the years that talk about this these these, these aren't new problems I, I you know me i don't like talking about stuff if we can't be if it's, if it's something that we can't fix i'm not interested in no talking. but i mean someone that knows what should be done and who the person should go to or who's responsible for a student being homeless somebody that has a key position i don't know who that person is but there must be somebody I'm sure there's uh, somebody. That, that I'm is, sure there's somebody. That, there's a whole list of somebodies. <laughs> I'm not interested in talking to nobody about what's wrong. I'm interested in talking to anyone who has a solution that we can implement. But that's what I'm talking about. It must be someone that can say if a student <laughs> is chronically homeless. This is what we're going to do. Yeah, this is what we need to do. This is where you need to go to. Who? This is the person that's who's um, responsible for it. That's kind of what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, It has to be somebody. If a student shows up to school and say, you, I have you, no place to live. You're the official booker of guests. Yeah, but I mean, since you had a guest <laughs> on Morning Talk. Live. I mean, I, if you you're on Morning Talk Live, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to get a guest? You can you you can always you uh, okay. You can invite anyone as you have in the past to this program. You are on it. Well, I would love for this guest to be on the show and actually have you interview them. I think hey, you would, yeah, you bring them in. I'll interview them. All right, I'll look into that. Then. All right, okay, and absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, if anyone put a question to me or a guest, I'll ask the question and and you know. Because truthfully, I don't know if you heard about that report that came out last week about two percent. I'm you're you're telling me now. I'll mm -hmm. look at the report. Yeah. I generally try to stay away from those things because they <laughs> they piss me off. <laughs> okay. <so> I, <laughs> yeah. Because I can't. You know. You see that. You see. You see through the madness. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I find that very disturbing. Disturbing, right? Well, again, good job at the press conference yesterday that the Greater Hartford African American Alliance y'all put together. Excellent press conference. Well, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, 
Yeah, see what we can do to make a difference. Right. That's all you can do, right? Mm-hmm. All right. Jonathan Small's here every Monday. Excuse me, every Tuesday. Tuesday, right. And uh, Cleo Du Wright is here every Tuesday. And sometimes we have special guests. Special guests today, we had uh, uh, Patricia Kelly, Ebony Horsewoods. And thanks to her. Thanks to Jay Hogarth for the music. And we'll see you all real soon. Bye-bye.